to step out for a bit, and he asked me to continue chairing the meeting. I hope that's okay with everyone. Um, I would then proceed with the next session, and um, the afternoon session is um, session number five on um, case study examples on the use of remote audit. So I would now like to invite the speakers from session five. So that's Mr. Hector Escobar, Mr. Alvaro Diaz Galmeza, and Ms. Choi Yun Yu to please press the raise hand button. I understand that Mr. Jim Mosley is with us in the room today. Yes, there you are, hello. <laughs> um, speaking, speakers that are joining via Interprefy, um, please stay online after your presentation until the end of the Q&A session. Session five will cover case studies on the use of remote audit by members and representatives of the agri-food sector providing an opportunity for speakers to shed light on the benefits and challenges of remote audit in practice. I will first give the floor to Mr. Hector Escobar, head of the Subdirectorate sub of Food Safety and Certification, National Fisheries and Aquaculture Service, and Mr. Alvaro Diaz Galmetzer of the Food Safety and Certification Department, Livestock Protection Division of the Agriculture and Livestock Service of Chile to present on Chile's experience with remote audits in animal and plant products processing establishments. Mr. Escobar, Mr. Diaz Galmetzer, you have the floor. Hola, muy bueno. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for the invitation. And when I say good afternoon, I mean a good day, depending on where you are. My country is due to share its experience on remote audits for animal and plant products processing plants. First, may I set out some context? Our country uh, is a major food exporter. It's the second industry after copper and makes up a very large proportion of our GDP as you'll see. We export some 170 countries around the world and of course are governed by a number of different trade agreements. It's worth pointing out what conditions are on offer with regard to safety, food safety in Chile. There are a number of different services. We have the Agriculture and Livestock Service, SAG, which looks mainly at the land-based um, industries. Then we have the National Fisheries and Aquaculture Service, which looks at more water-based industry. So, as you all fully aware, 2020 was marked by the COVID pandemic. And across the world, we saw borders closing, quarantines introduced, supply chains being disrupted, and a number of different measures being brought in with regard to safety and COVID-19. This led, of course, to uncertainty, particularly with regard to the way the virus was spreading and the checks that would be needed. And this, of course, disrupted the usual activities in these areas, and particularly those of the competent authorities whose responsibility food safety is. This, of course, uh, is alongside the changes in demand that we saw now, in this context, uh, we saw remote audits as having a number of potential advantages for authorities to ensure that food products continu continue to be traded. Next slide. So, our goals 
with regard to this uh, tool, mainly to be able to continue our work in the context of the pandemic and particularly with regard to the requirements that competent authorities have for the access to markets and then on top of that specific requirements and measures that were introduced for certain uh, food products. Next slide please. One of the main challenges in this kind of tool was being able to ensure that competent authorities recognised it as a tool. And indeed this led to issues of coordination so as to be able to continue to conduct the necessary audits and other major challenge was the support that was provided, the, the audio quality is insufficient for interpretation. Eh, los elementos, ¿no es cierto?, normales respecto a ponerse de acuerdo en las la agendas, ¿no es cierto?, en la disponibilidad también de los intérpretes, eh, eran situaciones que, que se requerían para poder realizar esta actividad. Disculpe, señor Escobar, los intérpretes... I'm very sorry, Mr. Escobar. The interpreters have informed us, unfortunately, that the sound quality is too poor. Would it be possible for you to move closer to your microphone, for example? Eh, me marca acá bien, no sé, digan. Um, ¿Puede repetir algo, por favor, para que... Ah, dos, tres, eh, no sé si me escucha, uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. ¿Es that Atención. better? Estoy con uh, el micrófono. Sí, ya ¿Puedo lo... usar otro micrófono? ¿No? Si tiene otro o si no, no sé si ahora está mejor, intentemos. Sí, si ahora está mejor, intentemos. ¿Y el micrófono acá? No sé si escucha mejor. Integrado, ¿no? Sí, ahora está bastante bien, me parece. Adelante. Bueno, estaba diciendo que los principales. So, I was looking at the different challenges with associated with remote audits, and particularly the coordination with competent authorities, as well as technological challenges within institutions, both in the public and the private sector. Furthermore, we also needed interpreters, the time for the evaluation, the various connections that are involved. Next slide, please. Here is a description of the overall process. One advantage is the sequencing of the inspection over time. It's allowed us particularly when it comes to initial desk reviews, not necessarily having to be done by the same team. In other words, different people can take up the different tasks according to their knowledge. Then there is, of course, a more real-time aspect to it, which is the remote audit itself, an initial meeting, gathering the various participants responsible or conducting the uh, auditory on national and regional levels where authorizations are required. Then an on the ground meeting which is done in person where possible and then a final step where a re final report with conclusions is issued. Now we have identified three different forms of remote audit, depending on whether it's done live or not, depending on the technology available, if it can be done in real time. A deferred mode where it is where it was not possible during the pandemic to conduct a real time. And then a combined type using both. Next slide please.
the main cases that we confronted in 2020 and more uh, frequently in 2021 were imports of live products such as in the salmon industry two countries particularly Canada and Iceland those were successful we did one full real time and another inspection which combined the two so in the case of Iceland there was some real time aspects when we connected with the authority now on exports we requested uh, audits mainly with China particularly for fisheries and agricultural products again involving both the SAG and Cerna Pesca and this may have been frozen or live products and this of course led us to look at different forms of plants across the range Peru also uh, where we looked at uh, trout products and Russia we also managed to connect remotely to look and we are uh, to conduct an audit and we're looking to pursue this in the future next slide please now at this stage I will hand over to my colleague Alvaro a good day to you all depending on where you are my role is to look at you as my colleague has said, at the particular experience of my service. Now, of course, we look at uh, livestock and agricultural products in the SAG and our experience in uh, remote audits. Next slide, please. With regard to imports our country has worked with, that, uh, with other countries throughout the pandemic at the beginning to ensure that trade flows continued and that requirements were met. To do this, we had first to categorize products according to their risk. And we heard earlier someone describing this product specific evaluation and the risk mitigation which is a process both uh, which is applied across agricultural products. We started by looking at the ones which won't need them and then those which had a high risk and which we saw to need a new audit mechanism. So fresh meat, fisheries, uh, uh, bovine and poultry and again these high risk products which required greater levels of SPS protection we therefore had to make domestic changes to our standards at the SAG to ensure that production plants met all of the requirements of Annex C of the SPS agreement we therefore had a desk review mechanism followed by a remote audit and these involved specific checks on those uh, processing plants that uh, process beef uh, that refrigerate meat or indeed those which are looking for approval or an extension this is a mechanism for example that was also used for renewals There was also a, a large logistical element with this, particularly coordinating with competent authorities, all of which was necessary to ensure that remote audits were conducted successfully. And then finally, we were, both in 2020 and then in 2021, able to begin remote audits, which 
continue to date, particularly for fresh uh, bovine meat as well as fresh porcine meat. Now, looking at the export side of things for agricultural and fisheries products, those establishments which have been approved also began a similar process as the one that we have been using. And uh, of course, this also required much logistical and technical coordination so as to meet minimum requirements, such things as the connection to the internet, uh, simultaneous interpreting, and so on, as well as the sending of initial samples. But not just, where they were also sending pre-recorded videos. And this is particularly the case for orchards. So again, this comes back to the combined hybrid audit that we heard about earlier using pre-recorded videos. Once all of the desk review and logistical arrangements were completed, we moved to the remote audit itself. The basis was a real-time connection to the plants involved And of course, this was very much like a normal in situ audit. In that it also led to a final meeting and a final report setting out um, the different evidence found. Here we see um, some figures of the remote audits that we conducted with a variety of countries on agricultural exports. China audited us for cherries, uh, nectarines, kiwis and citric, citrus fruits. Ten audits involving 30 plants and 30 orchards, which as I was saying earlier, involved pre-recorded and real-time video connections. We also had audits by Canada, Brazil and China for bovine meat, uh, goat meat and others, um, poultry, and particularly there we looked at COVID measures. Our audits of other countries, mainly in 2020, involved Mexico, which was the first, and this was for fresh meat and pork products, sub byproducts. And this allowed us to fine tune the technological requirements and particularly how it, they met the necessary criteria. We also worked with Brazil for fresh bovine and byproducts of bovine meat and we, this uh, was also extended to Colombia which uh, for similar remote audits and in the future we plan to continue with Brazil on a range of products Argentina for beef so this is a system that we continue to use as a tool for our audits and um, that both in pandemic times and beyond. Here I have set out the advantages and disadvantages of remote audits. On the advantages side, our experience in the pandemic showed we were able to protect the health of officials. In other words, those people who were due to conduct audits could do it remotely and therefore they were not uh, put at any risk. We also found that desk review could be conducted prior to a remote audit. Particularly, for example, uh, we s used to have one day for abattoirs 
to conduct that sort of exercise. So now we can do this uh, in go into much greater depth. And we've had heard this repeated over that there is greater accessibility with remote audits to those areas which are hard to reach with regards to on-site audits. New technology has uh, also been used for remote audits, both on a national level, for visiting uh, on a domestic level, as well as um, with competent authorities on local and regional levels. Another advantage is and allows the central competent authority to take part in remote audits and as we have said, experts, panels of experts and specialists can also be involved. For those plants that uh, produce a lot of sound pollution, again, this has been an advantage in remote audits, notably with regard to simultaneous interpretation, which has been much more fluid in those situations. Furthermore, it has opened up the process to associations and companies and interested parties. We've also noticed that the process for approvals and renewals of authorization has also become more fluid. However, there are some disadvantages. We noted that remote audits can lead to technical difficulties which hamper the smooth operation, particularly relating to internet connections, as well as physical aspects such as cables and devices for audio and video which are also susceptible to problems and require plan B, a second camera, or a second system so as to ensure that the audit runs smoothly. Sharing experience and establishing relationships of trust among human teams has also been uh, hindered. Unlike an in-situ audit where trust can be built promptly, this is not the same when doing things remotely. And again, this in the long term, with regards to long term trust, is also an issue as for communication between and among central and regional competent authorities. There is a training requirement for new technology, both in the company as well as in the competent authority. Furthermore, there is a certain resistance with regard to traditional audits. Now, of course, remote audits will not replace the advantages of the human senses. This, is, of course, is essential. Smell, touch, for example, are very important senses in audits. And there is a greater um, time constraint with regard to planning and preparing for each audit. Logistics, likewise, requires going into greater depth to be sure that an audit will be conducted in the best possible circumstances. Next slide, please. So, there are some challenges that we face in Chile with regard to remote audits. As we saw at the very beginning, there were no internationally recognised standards for this form of audit. We therefore found it to be important for us to be able to discuss how this was done. And we've had public hearings uh, Chile, in Chile. And this has led to us identifying some similarities and some differences. And this led us to review our 
internal framework and also to look to the international level. There is of course the training burden that's needed for remote audits, particularly with regard to staff, to ensure that all requirements are met. Uh, so that the audit is successful in its yeah. conduct. Furthermore, companies are also required to provide a lot of logistical and technical support to ensure the audits run smoothly. There are some small, medium-sized companies which may not be able to meet those, for example. And then one final challenge we see. The mechanism of remote audits is also something that has raised the question as to when would this be used just in times of pandemic or are there, is there some interest in using remote audits in other scenarios. Currently we're still using it, it's not at all going to replace on-site audits of course. We are therefore looking into this in more detail as to understand how best to combine the two types or whether or not there is an opportunity for only one to be used in the future. So the question that remains then is will remote audits be able to fully uh, replace on-site audits and of course this is an open question and something that we will be looking into as we move into 2023 and 2024. Of course greater studies and more knowledge is needed for this um, tool to be verified as, as um, replacing in situ. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Escobar y señor Thank you very much, Mr. Sescobar and Diaz. The floor to Ms. Choi Yun Ju, Deputy Director, On Site Inspection Division of the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety of the Republic of Korea, to present on the COVID 19 pandemic preemptive response with remote inspection. Ms. Choi Yun Ju, you have the floor. Working for Role on Site Inspection Division of NFDS of Republic of Korea. The COVID 19 pandemic has changed not only our daily lives, but also our way of working. The title sounds overwhelming, but are we share of NFDS cases, the inspection using digital equipment is triggered by the virus outbreak. I hope my presentation will give overall a CU insight and tips. Next, please. Before sharing the cases, I will give you a glimpse into Korea's safety policy for imported foods. Uh, this will help you to understand my presentation. Korea has been importing food products from many countries. Our import volume has been increasing as well. Therefore, the importance of safety control for imported foods got emphasized. As a result, the Special Act on Imported Food Safety Control was uh, introduced in 2015. The Act included the production stage, and since then, the safety of imported food product uh, has been controlled by the triplet system. In the production stage, customs stage, and the distribution state. The remote inspection is used both for inspecting foreign food facility in product states and for inspecting importers in distribution state. Today, let's see cases of remote inspection of foreign food facility in production states that my division is in charge of. Next, please. As a previous speaker mentioned and we experienced the COVID-19 preventive measures caused movement restrictions and the border protection and the quarantine measures prohibited 
Cardinal from entering the most of the countries. Our inspectors also could not travel because of the risk, risk of infection. At that time, we need the, the alternative to continuously maintain the free importation safety control. My colleagues and I have to come up with a way to inspection facility without visiting them. The remote inspection was the way as you expected. We designed the remote inspection into two parts, document inspection and the video inspection. During the document inspection, a checklist and the supporting documents are submitted and assessed. During the video inspection, the central control of the working areas is inspected in real time by utilizing telecommunication equipment. Next, please. To adapt Korea safety control for imported foods into the changes caused by the pandemic, we made a transition in the pre-importation safety control. To secure the effectiveness of document inspection, we conducted a follow-up program. For the better understanding, we created a comprehensive guide with the illustration, elaborating documents and purpose. To conduct a video inspection, we checked the upload and download speeds in 175 countries, and we found the speeds of most countries are fast enough to carry out the video inspection. We researched the ICT environment and the tools for video inspection, virtual meeting infrastructure, and the types of equipment for inspection. Lastly, we researched remote inspection cases and the related regulations in overseas countries and the global certification bodies. And then we found that the existing related act in Korea did not include the legal grounds for remote inspection. Therefore, to put the remote inspection in motion, we needed a legal ground. Next. Please. A new provision was added in August 2021 as follows. A remote inspection using ICT, such as computers and video communication, can be conducted when on-site inspection is deemed difficult due to natural disasters or infectious disease or required efficient and prompt inspection. Next, please. One month after securing the legal ground, we made an SOP. It includes security measures and specific steps for remote inspection. When the legal ground was discussed with the legislative body, our relational assembly, the importance of security measures was highlighted. Here are, here are security measures we preferred. The virtual meeting platform is required with the end-to-end -end encryption technology. When a video inspection is conducted, the platform with dedicated visual equipment and secure connection should be used. During the remote, remote inspection, we focused on obtaining the prior consent from facilities because the security is related to personal information and the facilities undisclosed information. I would like to introduce the MFDS some efforts to protect the facility information. The inspectors come from the security status before the inspection by going through a security self checklist. And many ins inspectors don't participate in the inspection. The number of participants were two to four, which is the same number for on site inspection. Required documents are submitted to our imported food management system. 
which was built with a security system in 2007. The imported food management system is a closed network where authorized users with a given ID can view a load information. The hacking attempt to this system and its security status are periodically monitored by the National Information Resources Service, which is the FEN governmental integrated data center. When you get the table on the screen, there are four steps in the remote inspection. In the planning stage, facilities are selected. Um, the last stage, document inspection. In this stage, the required documents are assessed. And then a video inspection follows. In the last stage, we implement measures on the facility depending on its remote inspection feature. Next, please. Uh, for smooth remote inspection, we made a contract with an agent who has visual equipment and offers interpretation service. The agent received a pre-training about how to conduct a remote inspection and precautions. Their task is to support us in a remote inspection by visiting facility in advance and checking the facility's internet connection. Therefore, the agent sometimes prevent the problems which happen when the facility is not used to the remote inspection. On the diagram on the slide, you can find the detail on how to conduct the remote inspection. The, the agent wears smart glasses and goes with the, the person in charge from the facility. The agent delivers the message from Korean inspectors to the person from the facility. And then the agent receives the feedback from the facility and the shows are in the facility to the inspectors. Korean inspectors can interact with and inspect the facility in real time. In this way, the inspectors are able to see anywhere in inspected spots. For your reference, when we inspect a facility in a country where its speed of live streaming is poor, we avoid the lunch time because mobile users use the internet during that time. The degradation of video images or connection issue can happen. Next, please. Now, I like to share the results and the implication we found after we carry out remote inspections. The best benefit of remote inspection is that the pre importation safety control can continue so that we can ensure from food safety. With remote, remote inspection, you can save the travel time and resources. Also, you can save the budget as the agent fee is relatively lower when compared to the one for on site inspection. Moreover, you can reduce the risk of the COVID-19 infection. The discussion paper from the Codex says less paper use your benefits. However, paper is not a new benefit for Korea because all information and documents of on-site and remote inspection, including results per assessment item, required documents from facilities, are submitted through the imported food management system. Therefore, we don't use paper except for a few documents requiring signatures. Along with the obvious benefits, challenges remain as well. For example, communication is not stable in enclosed spaces because of poor connectivity. And there is the reluctance from policies reluctance from facilities against the remote inspection due to the facilities' security policies. 
Since it was difficult to physically travel overseas countries in the pandemic, we adopted the remote inspection during the pandemic to replace the on-site inspection. However, we found the remote inspection should be utilized one of the assessment tools by choosing facility in order to optimize the effectiveness of remote inspection. Korea is not an only country to face these challenges. So among experienced countries, discussions and communication are required to address challenges and set the operating standards for the remote inspection. I think uh, there will be more seminars and programs related to this topic. Korea is ready to participate and to support such an opportunity. I'm coming to the end of the presentation, so I'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, I would appreciate if you send questions to my email. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that presentation. I will now invite Mr. Jim Mosley, CEO of Red Tractor United Kingdom, to present on the use of remote audit by a UK voluntary third party assurance scheme, approach and lessons learned. Mr. Mosley, you have the floor. Thank you. I'm just, okay, slides are up, excellent. So thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to present. Uh, I appreciate that today, the 21st of June, is the longest day in Europe, but I will endeavour not to make it any longer by trying to keep to my time. Um, whilst my presentation is, of course, fixed, I'm also very conscious it's the last one of the day, and it probably covers a lot of detail that the other very informative presentations have also covered today. So I'm going to try to customise my words and my focus during the presentation to address perhaps some of the challenges, the learnings, the opportunities that have been raised in many of the presentations so far. So, next slide, please. Just a very short overview of Red Tractor. So we are a UK voluntary third-party assurance program. We set standards for the entire UK food chain. And by that, I mean from farm through to the processor or the packer, through to the retailer, the caterer, or indeed the brand, and indeed all the stages in between. So we set standards for transport, for livestock markets, for grain storage, etc., etc. Our standards are comprehensive in that we cover food safety, animal health and welfare, environmental protection and worker welfare. But the key one is always food safety, and that's where uh, Red Tractor really started. We also cover almost all agricultural sectors in the UK, except for fish and eggs. Having set the standards, we license them to independent certification bodies who undertake the audits to ensure conformity, and those bodies operate to an ISO standard, ISO 17065. Basically, because our standards are good and the robustness of the audit regime is, is strong, it means that we can reduce the burden and the duplication of audits in the UK for both farmers and the supply chain. Next slide, please. So in a normal year, Red Tractor, through its certification bodies, would normally conduct around 60,000 audits throughout the entire food chain. Uh, as said, those audits are delivered by certification bodies. Um, and typically, uh, those audits would have been done absolutely physically before COVID, although it is fair to say that we were developing uh, an online filing cabinet uh, for uh, documents and records to be uploaded. The advent of COVID created major supply chain differences and changes in the UK. As I'm sure it happened in all other markets, the out-of-home consumption stopped, uh, retail sector boomed, and so many suppliers had to switch channels and find new routes to market. And plus, in the early months of COVID, we also had some food shortages in the UK. Some would say that's not a bad thing, but nevertheless, uh, it did create a lot of changes in the supply chain. And when you see those dramatic changes, that often brings greater risks so the need for audit and conformity is never greater in that period, and yet we couldn't physically audit, and so we had to find uh, an alternative solution. Next slide, please. 
So back in March 2020, these were our objectives uh, in, in establishing a different audit regime. Some of them may seem slightly strange today, but the first and most important was to ensure continued conformity when food safety was paramount. We had a number of people approaching us to become Red Tractor Assured, reflecting those changes in the supply chain. We had to find a way of auditing them. Uh, we wanted to retain the earned recognition agreements that we have from the regulator and other government bodies. And of course, we wanted to avoid the substantial inspection backlog, backlog which would have occurred. But by the same token, as others have said, we didn't want to put any people's lives at risk, both members, farmers, uh, assessors and so on. And we didn't want a regime that could have disrupted the supply chain to such an extent that people would then go short of food. In other words, setting standards or a regime that was preventing from food getting through uh, to consumers. So, um, next slide please. So the regime that we developed effectively consists of two parts, very similar to many of the other uh, presentations and formats that we've seen today. The development of the online filing cabinet to allow the supplier to upload documents and records, and the live streaming approach that enables the assessor to see the farm, talk to the farmer, etc. Very similar to, to that that we've seen. So let me build on uh, some of the points that were raised this morning. First of all, if I could go to the next slide, please. The second bullet down, it was very important that the assessor and the business, whether it be the farmer or the factory, agreed which technology to use and a, and an, a good amount of time spent helping testing training using that technology in order that it worked uh, when the uh, audit actually took place. Third bullet, connectivity. It's, it's an issue for almost everyone that's presented today. It was an issue for us as well. And of course, connectivity is an issue on a farm where you're often going into quite buildings and, and fields that are quite distant from perhaps your router, etc. <laughs> Now, the way we overcame the connectivity is to use live streaming technology that could always be recorded. And therefore, the assessor would speak, let's say, to the farmer and ask the farmer to go off and record to the instruction of the assessor. So in other words, I want you to film this building, that pen of pigs. I want you to focus on the floor. I want you to focus on the, on the condition of the pigs, et cetera, et cetera. Film, then come back and immediately play back the live recording that the, uh, that the farm has just taken. And this tended to overcome the vast majority of connectivity issues in that the assessor was still able to see live the footage that they would want to have seen had they been on farm and assessing. Um, and that worked extremely well. And I have to say that we were quite robust in that if the assessor didn't see or the farmer didn't film what was required, he was asked or she was asked to go and refilm and play back again. So that is the way that we, we overcame a lot of the connectivity issues. There was a second point in terms of connectivity. In our factory, we, in some respects, Red Tractor is a little fortunate, and I appreciate that, we, that our standards may be different from many markets. But under the Red Tractor standards, slaughterhouses have to have CCTV. And actually, you can use the CCTV instead of any live streaming technology. So this was, we found, a very useful method of still being able to do live streamed audits in factories using their own CCTV, which they need to provide uh, to us as part of the, the standards anyway. So that is how we, we overcame some of the connectivity issues that were presented. And secondly, on the security side, this was also a very big issue for both farmers who were concerned about uploading data, but also factories that were, we were uh, doing uh, live stream audits in. Uh, and so we had an enormous amount of passwords for the databases and for live streaming. Uh, the passwords were well protected, so using the hash technology as opposed to plain text. Um, we uprated our firewall around our website and our database. Essentially, we were able to provide sufficient confidence to the farmer or the factory operator that the security of what we were doing uh, was robust and that they therefore had confidence in it. Uh, next slide, please. 
We also worked with the regulator and government in designing and implementing the regime. So uh, the Food Standards Agency, that we have a very good relationship, uh, input to our design and, and implementation and witnessed an audit to ensure that they were happy. Uh, the regime was scrutinized by UCAS, which is the operator in, in the UK that ensures the compliance with uh, ISO 17065. And the conformity data was continued shared. So we shared it when we do physical. We continue to share that conformity data uh, with the FSA in line with the, the codex guidelines. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the results, um, and I'll ask you first just to focus on the top left-hand corner of the slide. So in the year between April 20 and March 21, we actually conducted 28,000 remote audit. So quite a considerable figure, which gives us an amazing database in order to look at those learnings uh, and such like. You can see also how they broke down by sector. Interestingly, when you look at poultry, the figure is very high, and that's partly because we went through several months of avian influenza where we had to do remote audits. We can't put a physical order to, onto the farm uh, when that occurs. Um, we found non-conformities. We still, the, the regime was robust enough to identify non-conformities. But it is fair to say that those non-conformities were at slightly reduced levels to those that we found on physical audits. And as an example, I've tried to pick out the fairest example. So if you looked at the dairy sector in the top left, you'll see we did just under 3,600 uh, remote audits, which was 48% of the total number of audits. So it's almost a 50-50 split in that sector. Of those members that had a remote audit, 61% of them was found to have at least one non-conformity. But when I look at the 52% that had a physical inspection, then that figure rose to 73. So we know that the physical inspection still finds more non-conformities than remote, but remote still finds non-conformities and still delivers a level of conformity which we, were, uh, which we wanted uh, and were keen to ensure that we could deliver. Um, also, I'd say that those, that those findings were mirrored in other sectors, but I also think we need to bear in mind that this was the very first year of a new regime. If we'd had to continue with this regime, my sense is that the non-conformities would grow, and that is partly because of anecdotal evidence from the assessors, who all agreed that in the early days of assessment, they probably weren't as robust. They perhaps did not ask the pig farmer to go and film every pen and the enrichment in that pens, etc. But as the year went on and they became more accustomed to that approach, they actually got tougher. And we can see the non-conformities in the last few months of this period actually beginning to, to increase. So my sense is if this period had gone longer, actually the non-conformities would have come up under remote inspection. Next slide, please. I'll probably spend no time on this slide of positives and negatives because they absolutely mirror what other people have said. We know that the document and records, uh, the focus on it went up because of the uploading to the, uh, to the portal. Uh, that was probably more time, it cost more time, but actually did improve the quality of, of, of portal work. Um, Non-conformity is still identified. On the negatives, everything that has just been covered in the last presentation. You lose all of those sensory elements, particularly smell on farm, which is important, but also the body language and the staff dynamics, which kind of give you the feeling of the culture on the farm or the factory. You miss somewhat with a, a remote audit. And then if I go to my final slide, please. So in terms of the future audit regime, physical assessments unquestionably remain the preferred audit approach and are particularly important when you want to look at animal health and welfare, the assessment of buildings, the culture on the farm. But remote assessments will definitely remain part of the tool in the toolbox. So when physical checks are impossible, of course we will use remotes, but the other learnings that it's given is that it does give us improved focus on document assessment, but actually for farmers particularly, that's going to become a benefit because the farmer simply updates the records that are on the online filing cabinet rather than have to go through the exercise from fresh every year. So that will actually be a benefit ultimately, particularly to farmers. The remotes also give us the opportunity to get assessors onto the farm or into the factory in a crisis or an emergency situation. So if, for example, we have some intelligence that 
faster remotely than having to get uh, a physical assessor on, on, on farm. It gives us the ability to audit during disease outbreaks, and I think this is an absolutely critical one. We've had probably in the last six months the worst episode of avian influenza in the UK for many years, but we are still able to get onto that farm and audit through remote inspection, which would have been virtually impossible uh, pre this uh, regime. It also allows the better rotation of assessors. So again, we change our assessors regularly to ensure relationships aren't really developed, but actually remotes allow you to, ro to, to get that rotation very quickly. The geography disappears uh, from, from your setup for, of assessors. And it gives us the ability to focus at different seasons. And, and a small point, but also as we train assessors, and they have to go, although they're employed by the certification bodies, they go through a red tractor training facility. As we train assessors, we found it far easier to train them on remote inspections than actually going out and shadowing and witnessing with another assessor. So my sense is that we will definitely use a blended approach of physical and remote audits in the future, which I think will give us increased robustness, but the efficiency and the flexibility that remote has brought. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mosley. Um, the floor is now open for questions related to the three presentations in this session. Who has a question for one of the speakers? Okay, I see Australia, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to all of our um, panelists just then for the presentations. I've been struck today by uh, a real sense of learning by doing um, in terms of, we, you know, we all got started on it. There's been a lot of lessons learned, a lot of improvements, and I think um, you, our last speaker just highlighted that. So my question is to our last speaker, um, and it was a question that uh, Mrs. Hinder raised earlier before. Uh, to Tesco. In terms of your growing level of confidence in terms of um, your assessors and ability to sort of recognise issues and sort of raise, uh, I guess, the efficacy of the remote audit process, what do you think you need um, from government in terms of regulation to support that? And did you, do you see uh, any areas of development in the future to give you a level of efficacy? Because I'm conscious one of, the con one of the conversations here today has been about lack of scientific evidence to support uh, where we're going here. Over to you, thank you. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, the Tesco presentation was excellent. Um, um, building on some, actually building on some technology that the certification body started with first of all. And I think it, it is fair to say, and, and Tesco mentioned it quite diplomatically this morning, but the, um, the, strangely the age and experience of the assessor does come into play. And it is true that some of the more experienced, mature assessors struggled more with the with the with the whole principle of the remote assessment and to get and and in addition the technology of the assessment whereas the younger assessors took it up very very quickly um, and saw it as a completely natural way to assess on farm so i think there is something around um, you know the uh, the use of technology and the and the comfort and ease with which technology uh, can be applied but Tesco were also absolutely right. There is absolutely no doubt that we will use technology far more in terms of assessment and certification in the future than we've done in the past. Uh, I think that's inevitable. I also see the benefits to the farmer because I think technology can share the data that's coming from that farm with many partners, uh, which ultimately would reduce the audit burden on farm. Your question also touched on, on regulation. Um, I probably am not in such a strong position to answer that, uh, to be honest with you. I mean, we have earned recognition agreements with various government bodies, including the Food Standards Agency. And as said, we, we did a lot of our work in conjunction with those bodies to ensure that that earned recognition would continue. My feeling is that a voluntary third party assurance program can assist government in the controls on food safety and such like, and that should always be our role, that wherever we can play a role and assist them, then we can. We have good coverage, we have very good data, which we're quite happy to share, and we can share that data because it is usually 
in the farmer's own interest to share it because it results in, in audit reduction. Uh, and that's the role I think we'll continue to play. Thank you. I see there's another question from Chile. You have the floor. Gracias, señora Presidenta. Thank you very much. My first part of my question was already raised by Australia, but I also wanted to know if we could um, address the gaps there are amongst private standards with regard to remote audit, because we've been talking all morning about the need for internationalization through the three sisters for such an activity. But when it comes to private standards, what is your view of things? Thank you, Chile. Um, Mr. Mosley, can you answer that question? Or, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> That's okay. I'm not sure I heard the question exactly. I think it was probably the difference between private assurance schemes and regulation. Um, Chile, quiero repetir la pregunta. Could you repeat the question, please, Chile? Yes, sir, do excuse me. I was referring to whether, in your point of view, there are gaps or differences to be resolved with regard to developing specific private standards for remote audits. Okay, uh, we, we, don't, we don't develop standards specifically for remote audits. Our standards are our standards. The difference is, is, the, is that we are simply auditing against those standards remotely rather than physically. So n n effectively nothing in our standards changed when we moved to the remote assessment. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Thank you. I see Anne, you have the... Your, your yeah, the thanks. Um, so just like what Jim was saying, we, we don't develop standards just for remote audits, but the reason why we're here and working with Codex is so that we don't work in silos this time. <laughs> and we learn from each other right away because we're at all the same level of understanding right now. Public and private sector, it's uh, quite recent. And so that we do harmonize right away our practices together from the public and the private sectors to have harmonized guidelines all together. So that's why we work with Codex to make sure we share the learnings from the industry on that. Thank you. Thank you, GFSI. Are there any other questions from anyone in the room or online? Um, GFSI assumed that's a legacy, <laughs> so I will move on in that, sen in that case to the next session. Many thanks to all the speakers um, for your interesting case studies um, that you presented in this session. Um, the last session for this event will be a panel discussion where panelists will discuss opportunities and challenges regarding the future use of remote audit. And I think as one of the speakers remarked, I think we've seen as remarkable similarities <laughs> among the um, challenges and opportunities identified in all the different presentations. So um, we have five panelists for this panel discussion, some of whom will look familiar from previous sessions. Um, we have Annelise Deus and Mr. Jean-Philippe Celestino Gouy with us in the room. May I ask the moderator, Ms. Nicola Hinder, um, and the remaining panelists um, who are joining us online, so Dr. John McEvoy, Mr. Carlos Navarro, and Mr. Claudio Moore, to please raise, press the raise hand button. Panelists participating virtually, you're kindly requested to keep your video turned on throughout this session, but please keep your microphone on mute when you're not speaking. Our panel today is composed of all the individuals just I just named, <laughs> Mr. Felipe Celestino Gui, whom you already know, Dr. John McEvoy. Um, Mr. Carlos Navarro is the head of the Department of Animal Health, National Fisheries and Aqua 
Agriculture Service and Mr. Claudio Moore from, is from the Department of Phytosanitary Regulation and Certification, Agriculture, Agricultural, Forestry and Seed Protection Division in the Agriculture and Livestock Service of Chile. And Dr. Annelise Deus from OECD, we already heard from this morning. So this panel discussion will again be moderated by Ms. Nicola Hinder, um, and I shudder to think what time it must be in Australia at the moment, so thank you very much to stay, for staying up this late. Ms. Hinder, you're, the floor is yours to moderate the panel discussion. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to advise that it's now 12.15, so just over midnight in Australia. So I hope that our esteemed uh, panellists who I'll be asking the questions to uh, can forgive Australia should a yawn somehow come into uh, a mid-sentence. I'm going to start by asking uh, Jean-Philippe, please. Uh, thank you, Jean-Philippe, for sharing uh, Brazil's experiences and insights from the different forms of remote audits, particularly those used during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, in your opinion, how could remote audits improve standardisation of procedures as you talked about in your presentation? Could you give those listening a little more detail? Okay, so thank you again, Nicola. Uh, so maybe the word standardization would be not better. Yeah, maybe harmonization of procedures. I, I think it's uh, more, it more, it will be more appropriate uh, concerning my presentation. So the point is uh, with more auditors, yes, uh, doing this, this audit, probably because of the, it's possible, it's easier. So we have bigger teams, as my colleagues already, already said, more ex specialists. Then it leads to more uh, harmonization because of course the, uh, we have more people uh, watching each other's uh, way of conduct an audit. But also when we think about the auditees, we have bigger teams. Yeah, and respecting confidentiality, uh, we have the possibility of recording these audits and it can be used uh, in a proper way uh, between the, the, this competent authority to review the procedures and to improve procedures, yes? That, and that's uh, something that in normal audits it, it would be not possible, yeah? When I start auditing, because I'm also an auditor, I used to go along with uh, older and more uh, experienced auditors, yes, but it was quite difficult. It's not uh, uh, that easy to go in every audit, and now we can go together, uh, at least remotely, and we are always learning something, and it leads to greater standardization or harmonization, if I think it would be the better word. That's it. Thank you very much. I think that um, I agree with you, Jean-Philippe, around standardisation rather than harmonisation. Uh, so it was interesting to hear your insights there as well. So just wondering again, Jean-Philippe, whether or not there are any other benefits that you have identified uh, in using remote audits that you haven't yet had the chance to outline uh, to those listening to the thematic session? Actually, during this thematic, thematic session, the benefits that I, I have not spoken, that I have not pointed my colleagues during all the day, all the morning, they have highlighted maybe uh, the, the harmonization, it's the, the bigger uh, point that I would like to, again, highlight. But the other benefits, they are all put here in, at this session. Um, it's a kind of a, a new tool that also can break down 
uh, barriers, both internal and external, concerning not only the pandemic, but sometimes financial issues. So it's really an interesting tool that can break down it, and I think it will be more used in the future. That's it. Thank you very much. I know that there are uh, people listening to our live stream and in the room today who are going to be very reassured that, uh, that government and regulators are considering using uh, ultimate technologies and remote verification um, for internal as well as external purposes. So Brazil's insight uh, is keenly appreciated. Can I turn now to uh, Dr. John McAvoy? Um, John, thanks for sharing your insights before uh, about the types of remote inspections used within the EU's regulatory framework. Um, what's been the biggest challenge that you have faced in auditing non-EU member states uh, with uh, remote verification or remote audits? And are those challenges more technological or are they more regulatory? Thanks, Nicola. Well, many of the challenges are challenges that we would face in a conventional audit. I mean, I'll, I'll take interpretation as one issue. Um, it's sometimes we find um, particularly with developing countries, where the policy is that that country should provide the interpretation for, um, for a given audit on the spot, um, that the quality of the interpretation is not particularly good. And that, you know, th there are ways to mitigate that when you're on the spot. I mean, somebody else may, may speak English if you're conducting the audit in English, for example. But when you're in a remote um, setting, it tends to accentuate uh, the problems with um, understanding. And in fact, that's, that's one shortcoming of, of remote um, video conferencing. Uh, and other people have alluded to it. You are missing in some ways body language. Um, I think it's, it's easier to misunderstand messages which are being sent uh, in such a forum uh, compared to physically being present. And of course, you miss the opportunity to have a, the private chat with your with your your colleagues and in, uh, in the auditee, as you would during a normal audit when you're in the car traveling between sites, when you're having dinner in the evenings. You know, th these are issues which I think we miss with the remote um, approach. Um, I, certainly, technological problems have have abounded. We, we've even seen it today on several occasions. Um, but I think that's that's uh, generally getting better. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, unlike the, the the colleague from Red Tractor, for example, uh, and also the colleague from from Tesco, who are I would say being extremely progressive in their use of uh, wearable technology to inspect sites, this is not something that we've actually embraced to any great extent in the in the context of our systems audits. We're still primarily um, looking at um, procedures, paperwork, training, the, the sort of the building blocks of, of a control system. Um, and, we, and we haven't, we've been a little bit uh, ambivalent about the, the utility of um, relying on someone else to hold a camera to show what you want to see, when in fact it's, it's not guaranteed that you will necessarily see what you want to see. And of course, you don't have the opportunity to trip over problems, as is frequently the case in a physical audit. So, I, I, mainly, I would say technological and interpretation issues, which again, you know, you can also have the same problems in a in physical audit, but those would be the main problems I think we've come across. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. What do you think are some of the most important considerations that need to be taken into account when thinking about a role for remote audits within a regulatory framework? Well, um, I would say this is my, this is my personal opinion. Um, in the event that 
you were constrained in terms of your budget or your ability to travel, um, it's more likely that you may contemplate using remote auditing, a remote auditing approach for a trusted trading partner um, or perhaps a, an EU member state. Um, I don't think, and in fact, we don't as a rule for new market access applications, we, we are not using solely remote techniques. We are using remote techniques, obviously, in that we are assessing a lot of documentation um, which would be necessary to understand fully before contemplating actually carrying out a physical audit on the spot. Um, but certainly we wouldn't be just relying solely on the basis of um, a, a remote auditing and documentary evidence alone. Um, so, I mean, as I said earlier, um, aspects of remote auditing we are maintaining in our approach as we move forward. Uh, we are conducting uh, many meetings now remotely, whereas before we would have done those on the spot, for example, with a, a regional competent authority. Uh, we're now doing those remotely in advance. So the sequencing of the audit might change somewhat. And, and we're trying to, let's say, focus our time on the spot really to looking at examples of how the competent authority has performed in, in a given region, in a given locality. Um, so we are taking forward some of the lessons that we've learned for remote audits. But in relation to um, sort of whole scale adoption of remote auditing in preference to either hybrid or conventional audits, no, I, I don't see us going down that route. It will always be supplementary to our core business, which is physical auditing, really. Thank you. We can't hear you, Nicola. Um, we can see you again now. Nicola, would you try the sound again? It looks like you're on mute. We're trying to see if the IT support can help. Could you say something? I think I just heard you, Nicola. So would you give it one more try, Nicola? And if it doesn't work, we might be able to ask your colleagues in the room to read some of the questions for you. <laughs> Nicola, please go ahead and try. Hmm. No, I'm sorry, I can't hear you for now. Um, so go ahead, please, Australia. 
indeed. Um, and I, once again, yet another example of remote uh, not necessarily delivering quite the high service quality of face-to-face. -face. Um, so uh, in, in, while Nicola is getting the system worked up, I'm happy to ask a few more of the questions. So to our colleagues uh, from Chile, to Mr Carlos Navarra and to Mr Claudio Moore, um, given there are often many different agencies involved in regulation, do you think countries can agree to and adopt a nationwide approach to remote audits? Carlos and Claudio would be, will be able to reply to that question. Thank you very much for the question. If I understood correctly, this is re referring to those countries that the quality of sound is insufficient for interpretation. En ese sentido, como ya lo han mencionado varios expositores esta mañana, eh, nosotros consideramos que es una herramienta suplementaria. Excuse me, disculpe, Carlos, and escuchamos un... I'm very sorry, Carlos, to interrupt you, but there is, seems to be some background noise. Maybe there is an issue with your microphone. Perhaps you could just verify your equipment, because we're not hearing you very clearly. Yeah, okay. Um, ¿me escucha bien ahora? Um, no, do you, do you have a headset? ¿Tiene usted un micrófono? Do you have a headset microphone, perhaps? Sí, un momento. ¿Me escucha ahora? Sí, lamentable. Uh, regrettably, we continue to hear the same background noise, but if you wish to proceed. Bueno, vamos a, a responder. Eh, como, como señalaba anteriormente, nosotros creemos que esta es una muy buena herramienta que eh, debe sumarse a las auditorías en terreno. Eh, por todos los beneficios que eh, se han comentado durante esta mañana, no obstante ello, eh, cada, cada país debiese definir en qué condiciones es más adecuado la utilización de esta herramienta, ¿ya? que tiene que ver con el tipo de certificación que se está otorgando, si es primera certificación o es una revalidación de una certificación, eh, los, las las, las la performance que ha tenido el, el auditado, eh, si es que haya ha sido inspeccionado en varias oportunidades, la confianza que existe en realidad con, con, la, con las distintas instalaciones. Eh, creemos que el interés que se ha mostrado en esta sesión por este tipo de, de herramientas eh, la reconoce y eh, debe ser incorporada, eh, pero definiendo claramente cuáles son los estándares y en qué circunstancias eh, puede ser usada. Gracias. No sé si... Thank you very much. Now I'm not sure if your colleague would like to make any additional comments. Parece no ser... That doesn't seem to be the case. You want to ask the next question? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, and thank you very much to our colleagues from Chile for that intervention. Um, I'll turn now to uh, Dr. Annalise Deuce, who is from the OECD and is in the room with us. Um, Annalise, I'm conscious it's early days in, in the work you're doing in remote audit, but through your case studies of different economies and their experiences with remote audit, have you noticed any major conflicts in the approaches taken by different economies um, which may cause challenge for, for others if they were to be widely adopted? Thank you for the question, uh, Australia. 
So yes, exactly. We're still very early in our research, so it's a little bit hard to draw any definitive uh, conclusions. But when we're comparing approaches in different economies, it's clear that many of the differences that we witness offline in the offline world are also apparent in remote auditing. For example, we see that some of the economies have very prescriptive and uh, comprehensive approaches, while other economies have more of a risk-based or outcome-focused approach. Uh, and so, of course, where there is a more prescriptive approach, that also means that it might, might increase the compliance burden. Um, it would also be interesting to see how um, to watch the development of the so-called hybrid um, audits. Um, and approaches because different countries are using different definitions. So in some cases, when they're talking about a hybrid approach, it means that some steps of the auditing process are hybrid, for example, um, are, sorry, are remote, for example, the document assessment, which is desktop based, and then uh, other steps of the auditing approach are in person, for example, the site visits. In other cases, uh, when they're talking about hybrid approaches, they're talking about the fact that some of the audits are entirely in person and others are entirely um, uh, virtual. And then we've even seen a couple of cases where both um, a remote audits and then there was uh, a subsequent in-person audit where exactly the same information was um, assessed and verified. And of course, this also increases the um, compliance burden. And this is especially a problem for um, developing economies and smaller businesses. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I think um, uh, we're going to see if Nicolek is back online. Okay, uh, we can't hear you yet, Nicola. Um, so maybe I've just got one more question, and um, Annelise, back to you. Uh, I've been really interested to hear the perspectives of industry today, and uh, you know, there's some very forward-focused activity that is happening in the business community. Do you think there are lessons that regulators can learn from industry um, in adopting and conducting remote audits, and has there been anything of that nature that's come up in your discussions so far to date? Uh, yes, thank you very much again for that question. Unfortunately, we haven't done any um, interviews as of yet with um, the industry. We focused mostly, entirely, in fact, on uh, talking to government officials and regulators. But maybe um, I can share some things that surprised us when we were doing uh, those uh, interviews. So uh, first, um, something that we found very interesting is during our conversations that um, there was not really a greater use of uh, innovative technologies such as big data, uh, drones, virtual reality. So we thought that was quite um, interesting to see. Maybe it's due because we've only talked to the public sector so far and only a small sample. So maybe if we start talking to businesses, uh, as we've already heard with uh, our uh, Tesco, they are using more advanced uh, virtual um, reality. So as we gather more information, maybe we'll also see um, more uptake of more some of those more innovative technologies um, and this is also something that we've seen in other um, types of um, um, business models. Um, another thing that surprised us was um, the fact that there was, how to say, like when we were asking uh, for experiences are the, the, the main disadvantages with remote audit that um, data security was never the first one that was listed. So it was often connectivity issues, um, um, uh, preparation, the prepa preparation before the audit that took way much more time when the audit was remote, uh, all the documents that were uh, shared or required, uh, issues with the equipment, issues uh, with the fact of the census. But it, data security was something that always came a little bit later on the list. And, and the general view was, you know, um, we just wanted to keep trade flowing, and I guess that's mostly also because most of the remote audit experiences were because of COVID-19. And also, um, auditees said, yeah, we don't have that much control over uh, this, this aspect. And then something else is when we started this um, project is we had assumed that there would have been already a big shift towards remote audits pre 
uh, COVID period. And in fact, we noticed that there was only a modest shift um, of using in, that, that had been in place before um, the, the pandemic. And in fact, this was confirmed also by uh, the survey that was done by UNIDO, where they said that 90% of um, started started their remote auditing because of, uh, of COVID, uh, COVID. And then also uh, maybe a final point is that, uh, and this point has been made also by many of the speakers today, is um, there has been now this experience of full remote audit for c several years, and it's clear that there is a, a preference to go towards a hybrid form or a blended format for the next uh, in the future. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And Chair, um, over to you perhaps to open it up for some broader questions. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Australia. I see that Claudio Moore from Chile is online now, so I was wondering if maybe you had some comments in response to any of the questions that you would like to make um, before I open up the floor for questions from um, participants. And please start thinking about your questions. <laughs> Claudio, you have the floor. Hola, <clears throat> buenos días. Well, good afternoon. Now, interestingly, we've seen, I think, some connection issues in this meeting, and it's ironic because it can be one of the biggest problems, but more generally. In Chile's case, as we've said, for different products, different fruits, these are all looked at by different institutions. They're, in, they're institutions which sometimes have their own inspections as well. And sharing information with them, we've seen that we often carry out things in similar ways. There are, of course, differences as well. When we're talking about installations, orchards, for example, or farms, which are very far away from major centres, of course, this might be the, same, the case at sea as well. There are, there are aquaculture zones which are very far away from the coast. So, of course, inspecting them can be very difficult. So we carry out a report, we record videos as well, and then we send documentation. But we've seen that there is action which can be done to complement or simply to share the work amongst different institutions. And this is perhaps a way of thinking about regulatory alignment or at least a alignment of the process when it comes to remote inspections. So thank you very much. That's what I had to say. Gracias a usted. Thank you very much. So now I would like to open the floor for questions or comments from participants here in the room as well as from those who are connected online. Who has any questions or comments? Yes, Mr. Howard Popula. Thank you, Chair. Um, oftentimes when there are data breaches, it takes a little while to know and to act. And um, based on what we've seen, especially in the financial world with data breaches, I was wondering if anyone present here or online, any of the organization, has experienced data breaches during uh, remote or virtual audits and what the impact has been on that experience. Thank you for that question. Would anybody like to respond? And if I understand correctly, this is a question to anyone who may have some information, not just the speakers from the last session. While we all reflect on that, are there any other questions? Does anybody else have a question? Um, yes, Chinese Taipei, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. 
Uh, I think in the traditional on-site audit, there is a document reviewing process before the auditor departure. And according to many speakers' presentations today, uh, the remote audit is divided into two processes. The first is document review, and the second is video stream streaming, whatever it has been called in different presentations. So it seems to me that um, the lines between these processes are not clear in remote audit. And uh, I would like to ask would uh, any speakers could explain a little bit more on how to distinguish these processes in remote audit? Thank you. Thank you, Chinese Taipei. Would any of the speakers like to take the floor? Mr. Mosley, you have the floor. Uh, just to answer the, um, although it appears that it's divided in the two halves, if a farmer or a factory would prefer, prefer to have everything done live streamed, including the document review, then that's possible. It's just it makes the live streamed audit much longer. And given that it was already running long because you're sometimes asking particularly the farmer to go off and record and then play back, we tried to limit the amount of overall time required for the audit. And therefore, if they can upload documents and records in advance, it just means that the live streamed full audit is shorter. But if they're not prepared to do that because of data, and we haven't had any data breaches, but if they, if they were concerned about uploading documents and would like the whole audit to be done as if the assessor was visiting the farm, and therefore the documents reviewed at the same time, we can do that. We do it through the live streaming operation. Thank you for that reply. Would any other speakers like to take the floor? Um, Jean-Felipe, uh, to be followed by Annelies from OECD. So, uh, comparing remote and on-site audits concerning the Chinese Taipei question, uh, the principles are the same, yeah? So we are, in Brazil at least, we are using that kind of remote assessment, the document review, uh, way before COVID, yeah? So for us, for our experience, it's not that difference. Uh, we don't have a difference between what, what we are doing now on remote audits and what we are doing before COVID, yeah? Because it's a kind of a new tool the remote assessment of these documents that improves the audit. And uh, for us, at least, we think that the audit starts way before, uh, in the traditional way, the day that the auditor step in the establishment or in the country to, to look out for uh, uh, the, the procedures. Yeah, so the audit starts uh, mm -hmm. at the day that the auditor starts looking for the documents at the document review. But it's, there, is no, no, there is no difference between remote and uh, on-site audits concerning this specific point, yeah? It's the principle are the same. Thank you. Annelies from OECD, you had also wanted to take the floor. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Chinese Taipei, for that question, which is obviously uh, a good question that we're all thinking about. Um, you, you mentioned two different parts uh, to the auditing process, and when we were when we were setting up this project, in fact, we thought it would be good to have uh, three different parts, um, namely looking at our examining documents, interviews, and visits. And we, we, we thought that would be interesting because, you know, you can have either an in-person or a physical component, or you can do it virtually remotely or um, off-site, right? And then so, for example, if you're thinking about documentation assessment, you could, you know, look at the documents in person or just the, the physical copy or you could share it via email. Same for interviews, you could do them in person or you could do them virtually via Skype or, or Zoom. And then for the site visits, the same thing, you could go to the site or you could do it via videos or, or cameras. And of course, you know, these different parts can take place at the same time. You can look at documents while you're doing an in-person visit, but maybe thinking about it in, in three different parts instead of two different parts might be a way to uh, accommodate that. Thanks. Thank you for that response. I see that Nicola is <laughs> online again. Um, would you like to try one more time? <laughs> Uh, 
I'm afraid we still can't hear you. I'm so sorry. I will now give the floor to um, Alvaro Diaz from Chile. Um, and if any of the other speakers, you're, I see you're still connected, would like to reply to any of the questions, please feel free to give us a sign. Um, Chile, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to come back to the experience of documents. Now, we've seen a difference between the information analysis, which is done upstream, and here we were able to go into much more detail. So, and basically we'd done more prep so that on the day of the remote audit, we did have a lot of documents to base our questions on. We then also had a verification questionnaire, and this was used with the central competent authority, and they used that to verify the physical requirements. And basically this is used by, by someone who's sent on the ground and it's just a, it's basically a checklist that can be filled in on the ground and we then have that information for the remote audit. And that gives us a guarantee or at least some security, some confidence that the central authority has gone and checked that the basic conditions are uh, being met. Basically that those basic requirements are being met before the virtual audit takes place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions or any other responses from any of the speakers that are connected? Would anybody make a, like to make a comment? I see um, Dr. McAvoy, you have the floor. Thank, thank you. Um, well, I think it's a very good point about the upstream um, analysis of, of documentation. I think one of the one of the problems that we have also faced is the sheer volume of documents which we have received and usually require machine translation um, in advance. Um, I mean, machine translation is very good. It's getting better all the time, getting more accurate for, for many languages, but not all. Um, but there's no there's no doubt that um, there is a possibility of information overload even even in advance of the, the the opening meeting taking place. So if anything, we have um, probably been, let's say, narrowing this the the focus of our of our audits as time has gone on. Um, we we had one we had one case recently where we had over a thousand a thousand documents, not even pages, a thousand documents in relation to an audit, which took place over the, the course of a month and probably took around 20 working days in total of audit time. And that was in part due to, I would say, over ambition on our part <laughs> in terms of how the, the audit was organized. But I think it, it taught us a useful lesson um, in not trying to do too much and, and making sure the scope is relatively narrow. Um, for data breaches, we, we haven't had any issues with data breaches that, that I know of. Um, certainly in some other areas outside the SPS area, for example, in the area of medical devices, we do have secure, um, a secure database into which uh, proprietary information can be uploaded. I'm, I'm talking about the uh, intellectual property from um, third party um, certification bodies for medical devices. So it's all highly commercially sensitive information and that's uploaded into a, a secure database, circa BC, which is run by the commission. But um, to my knowledge, I mean, most uh, most uh, information is sent to us by email, as it was when we were doing conventional audits as well. Thank you. Many thanks for that reply. I don't see any other flags up. Um, Please make me a sign if anybody else would like to speak. Um, Nicola, or are you gonna try? <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. We still cannot hear you. Um, 
Well, if I don't see any other requests for the floor, um, so I think we have reached the end of the thematic session. I see that Australia would like to take the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. And on behalf of my colleague, Nicola Hinder, who is, you know, <laughs> frustrated by the wonder of technology, I'd just like to make some final wrap-up comments. Um, I'd like to thank all the panelists, panelists for sharing their knowledge and experience today. We've had a really great discussion. I'd particularly like to thank the Secretariat for working closely with us to design a really interesting discussion and for all their support and expertise. Uh, I think we've heard a lot today about the similarities. Uh, we've heard a lot of um, benefits and challenges. We've heard about the incredible importance of planning, preparation, logistics, technology, connectivity, <laughs> training, um, clarity of communication. Uh, there's a real discussion about choosing when to use remote audit, what is the right purpose for it, the scope, and, and sometimes people have found themselves on the wrong side of remote audit. They would have been better to choose a face-to-face. -face. And so there's clearly a lot of learning and um, further work we could do. There's obviously guidance that's being developed by CFIX in drafting the standards, and that will be very valuable. There's the work the OECD and UNITO are doing. We look forward to hearing that. Um, I also note the calls today for building the research and the scientific robustness to further support the case. Uh, it's also clear that this is a tool that's not going away, and that was part of our thinking in setting this up, uh, is that it's, it's becoming very much a, a tool in the toolkit for all of us, and as we learn and get better at it, uh, we will find some real expertise, and clearly industry once again out the front leading ahead of government in terms of their adoption, uptake, and their investment in remote audit. So um, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you all for your participation today, uh, and thanks again to the Secretariat for their support. Thank you, and we would like to thank Australia for really working closely with us also in putting this together. Um, well, not to repeat what you just said, um, I think it has been a very interesting and informative discussion with many interesting presentations from members, international organizations, and industry representatives. Um, I am really sorry about the technology. The gods were not with us today. <laughs> and maybe it was a useful reminder that we cannot rely on it too much. I trust that the thematic session has provided insight on the various forms of remote assessment, ongoing initiatives, and experiences relating to the use of remote assessment methods. And we heard quite a lot about the benefits and the challenges. So let me thank all of the speakers for your presentations and interventions on these important topics. I must also extend my sincere th thanks to all the participants for your engagements and to the interpreters for their work. It's not always easy when the sound quality is not always very good. Um, all the presentations delivered today will be posted on the WTO SPS Gateway page. Um, and we will also prepare a short factual report on today's discussions that will be shared with delegates by email and will be included in the summary report of the formal meeting that starts on Wednesday afternoon. We will reconvene in person and through Interprefy for the informal meeting of the SPS committee tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Geneva time for those of you who are in Geneva in this same room. Thank you once again. Have a nice afternoon or evening. Um, the thematic session is now closed. <laughs>